I live in a place called Dark Hollow, about 20 minutes outside of Pittsburgh. It's a really nice neighborhood, really leafy and green with some really nice old houses, and I won't deny that I've been immensely privileged to have grown up there. But at the same time, there was a huge downside to living there too, and that came in the form of the Ward family. The Wards were an absolute nightmare to live near to, and they made pretty much every other family's lives unbearable at some point for a variety of different reasons. Individually, they were bad enough, but collectively, they were like a horror movie level of nightmarish. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if there was some budding horror filmmaker who writes or directs the next Hereditary, and it all comes out that it was inspired by the Wards. The patriarch of the family was named Winston, or Wynn for short, but being one of Wynn's neighbors was nothing short of a serious loss. Now for reference, I had most of my encounters with Wynn when I was a teenager, and being a girl, Wynn always took a certain liking to me that he just didn't show to other people. He was always sickeningly polite with me, the kind of polite that verged on weirdly flirtatious. To other people... It probably just seemed like he was overly nice, maybe a little socially awkward, but being alone with Wynn or in situations where there weren't close observers, that was a different situation entirely. There were a handful of occasions where I caught Wynn looking at me in a way that made my skin crawl. He had a hunger in his eyes, like this beastly ravenous look, like he wanted to eat me alive. His eyes would glaze over and his lips would curl up ever so slightly in this horrifically perverted way that always made me feel stupidly uncomfortable. There was one time when I bumped into him in a convenience store near to downtown Pittsburgh. After he said hi and made a little small talk, he seemed to follow me around the store for a little while. He acted all innocent, making out like he was just browsing stuff in the aisles, but at some point, he got way too close to me. I think I was just too nervous to actually do anything about it. I didn't want to make a scene or cause any unnecessary conflict. After all, what would I tell people? Mr. Ward stood near me in a store. Anyways, when he was standing close to me, I heard him sniffing the air, like taking these big inhalations of breath through his nose, almost like he was trying to smell me. I couldn't walk away fast enough, and in the end... I left the store without even picking up what I went in there to buy. Like I said, he was overly nice to girls and women, but an absolute monster to any boys or men who happened to catch him in the wrong mood. He once ran out of the house with a baseball bat when my big brother used their driveway to turn around once. And the way he told it, if he hadn't driven away as fast as he could, Mr. Ward probably would have done some damage to his car. Then there was his wife, Maggie. Maggie always wore way too much makeup. I mean, so much it looked really jarring, and she plucked her eyebrows really, really thin. I'm pretty sure she was a good few years younger than Wynn, but the way she made herself up made it seem like she was 20 or 30 years older and was just trying to look younger. Maggie was famous for sitting out on their porch and knitting, which I think contributed to the whole old person vibe she gave off only she didn't really ever seem to be knitting anything. I remember walking our dog around the neighborhood and getting a look at the tangled mess of yarn she just seemed to be poking needles into. It was like a lime green spider web, just a tangle of thread she stared at like she was in some kind of trance. She also had this talent for turning super happy sounding innocent nursery rhymes into the creepiest sounding things singing them all slow and deliberate in a sing-song voice that sounded like a combination of a creaking door and nails on a chalkboard. I remember one time when we got some of their mail delivered to our house by mistake and my mom made me go over to drop it off. Mrs. Ward was sitting on their porch, poking these dirty-looking knitting needles into a tangle of yarn and singing. Ring around the rosy, a pocket full of posies, ashes ashes we all fall down when she looked up to see me standing there with the mail in my hand she acted all scared which was nuts because i think i was way more freaked out to be over there but she thanked me for bringing the mail over anyway yet before i turned to leave she asked me if i knew what nursery rhyme she was singing 
I nodded, and she asked if I knew what the origins were. I said no. And she went on to explain to me that the song had its roots in some old plague that had swept across England. I think she meant the Black Death, but I can't be certain. She said the ring around the rosy part was a reference to a rash that was a symptom of the disease, and a posy was a collection of herbs that was carried to mask the scent of rot that the dying people were said to have given off. Then she tells me that the all fall down part was a reference to people dying from the plague. I don't know how true any of that is, but Jesus, it freaked me out to have her tell me that in her weird scratchy voice with her face all painted up like some circus clown. Their younger son Jacob Ward was a total freak. He was obsessed with Native American culture, which I'm not saying is a bad thing at all, but Jacob was totally toxic about it. It was rare that you'd see that kid and he didn't have his face painted or have this grim homemade headdress on or whatever. He also liked to run around with a bow and arrow that his parents insisted was totally harmless and use those cartoony sucker tip arrows. But there are a lot of people, myself included, that swear that they'd seen him using actual sharp tip arrows on a handful of occasions. He'd aim them at you, pull the drawstring back to the point that you'd actually run for cover, but he never seemed to fire any, and you could never catch him using them whenever there were any grown-ups around. They actually got a social worker called over at some point because a few people had seen Jacob walking around with dead squirrels or pigeons. I'm not sure if he'd shoot them himself with his bow and arrow or they were just roadkill or something, but it was alarmingly enough to enough people that they actually had a visit from someone. Although whether or not that actually came to anything, I don't know. Then finally... Their older son was this kid named Johnny. Johnny was the kind of kid that growled at people in high school when they got too close to him, and before he got expelled for fighting, did something seriously messed up. Apparently he asked this girl to go out on a date, some super pretty but super nerdy girl who happened to be his lab partner. She says no, and Johnny doesn't take it very well at all. He made things difficult for her during chemistry by not talking or looking at her and Eventually, she had to basically beg the teacher to switch partners so she could even get a passing grade. Not long after, she was driving back from school in her seemingly empty car when she looks in the rearview mirror to see Johnny just sitting in her back seat, grinning at her. He'd apparently broken into her car and hidden in the footwell in her back seat under some blankets or something, or at least that's what we all figured he'd done. She was so scared she crashed her car and had to spend a week in the hospital. All Johnny got was a visit from the cops and a warning to stay away from her, and somehow it was all just blamed on teenage hijinks. I think maybe because the girl's family were too scared of the wards to press charges or whatever. I'm sure there's more to that story, but that's all I know of that. When the for sale sign finally showed up from the ward's house, I think Dark Hollow was about ready to throw a big party to celebrate them leaving, and after they did, they became something of an urban legend, basically a campfire tale that only a handful of people really knew was actually true and not something we made up to scare people. Like, I still think it's a miracle that there wasn't any bigger drama to happen involving the wards, something like a murder or whatever, little Jacob shooting someone with an actual arrow. I know Johnny basically almost killed his lab partner in that car crash, but but somehow they never actually went through with seriously hurting anyone. But who knows, maybe a couple of more years and there would have been a fatality. And who knows what they've been up to, wherever they moved to. Maybe it's only a matter of time before they seriously hurt someone. Before I moved across the country for college, I lived with my mom in Fresno, California. I love her, and she always did her best for me and my sister with what little she had, but I think she'd be the first to admit that we live in a terrible neighborhood, with little opportunity to improve our situation. But I guess that's just how life is when you're a teenage pregnancy with a father who just disappeared in the thin air. But growing up, I always thought my mom was kind of terrible. She rarely let us play outside, wouldn't ever let us go to the store on our own, 
She acted like an all-around control freak whose goal was to make our lives as boring and uneventful as possible. Later in life, we had a major heart-to-heart -heart where she leveled with me about why she was so strict with us when we were growing up. After that, I understood why she was the way she was. The family next door were heavily involved in meth and gang activity, but they weren't just partying and dealing out of the family home. They were a group of seriously sadistic psychopaths who did things to the local community that could pretty fairly be described as pure evil. They got raided by the cops in the end, but not before they'd done some pretty irreparable damage to the neighborhood. And my mom opened up by telling me about one particular incident that had been the catalyst for her being so strict with us. Apparently, they used a little recruitment tactic on more than one occasion. One that involved inviting a young girl over to party before forcing her to smoke meth. They'd keep her there for days, just feeding her meth and loaning her out to partygoers. That's the least obscene way I can phrase it, but you get the idea. Then they'd threaten to tell her parents or tell the call of cops on her, some kind of blackmail method to keep them coming back and bringing their friends and siblings, etc. From what I understand, it was kind of a vicious cycle of like, brainwashing girls which in turn attracted more guys which then allowed them to sell considerably more meth since lewd activity was involved. My mom also said that more than once she saw two guys carrying unconscious people out to a car, throwing them in the back seat and then driving them away, and that on a couple of occasions she saw missing posters for these people tacked up around the neighborhood. I asked her why she didn't go to the cops about the family and she actually broke down crying. She said she was constantly terrified and had multiple encounters with the family members next door who told her that if the cops ever showed up, they'd make sure that she suffered. She told me that they once warned her that they were heavily armed, had all kinds of automatic weapons inside their place, and that if the cops ever came, they'd rather all die in a shootout than be taken alive. Apparently, they laughed about how they had guns so powerful that they'd rip through the neighborhood, and that our family would probably die in the crossfire or something. That was something that absolutely terrified her. We were all she had in the world, and she wanted to protect us at all costs, so the idea of us losing our lives to some horrific drug-fueled shootout, it was unimaginable. My mom was a quarter Mexican too, and she knew a few things about something called Santa Muerte, a kind of pagan figure that some Mexican people worship as like a personification of death. She said she could sometimes hear people in the backyard of the meth house invoking her name, possibly even making sacrifices since she heard chickens squawking and goats bleeding. And according to her, a lot of people who worshipped Santa Muerte were connected with Mexican cartels and were not to be messed with. She didn't want to take the chance. It took her years before she was able to afford to move, and by that time, I was a sophomore. But I can't even describe the relief I felt when I heard she was moving away from Fresno with my little sister. For the first time in years, I was actually excited about going home to visit. We were finally away from that psycho family of meth-addicted, death-worshippers. For the longest time, me and my family lived next door to these absolute insane people that made our lives a complete living hell for like an entire year. They were pretty well behaved for the first few months after they moved in, but after a while, they started absolutely blasting music in the middle of the night. I'm not just talking about that gentle kind of bass thump that passively is annoying. I'm talking the kind of loud where you couldn't get a wink of sleep. The police had to be called out a few times to get them to turn it down, and even then, they confessed that they couldn't really do anything other than issue fines. They got progressively worse, though, and it turned out half the reason the music was so loud was to mask the sounds of the mom and dad having these legit fist fights in the middle of the night. It wasn't even a case of it being a one-sided domestic abuse, either. The dad sometimes had worse black eyes than the mom, and scratches all down his face where she'd obviously clawed him to death. They used to knock the seven shades out of each other, but 
we didn't think they were too dangerous to anyone outside their own family. Once or twice my dad had gotten into confrontations with them about the smell coming from their backyard or the fact that they used to blast music. The dad of this insane family had threatened to kill my dad once or twice, but none of us thought that he would actually go through with it and thank god they didn't. Then for some reason it went really quiet over there for a few weeks and it got to the point we thought that it actually moved. Only they hadn't moved at all. They were just keeping their heads down because they'd straight up killed their own daughter. Apparently she tried to run away from home and ended up in a shelter somewhere. They tracked her down, dragged her into their car one night, taken her somewhere secluded and then beat her to death. I'm not sure they even meant to kill her. They just beat her up so bad that she ended up dying not long after that. That's why they'd been so quiet. They didn't want to bring down any attention on themselves when they were dealing with disposing of her body. We had police basically camped out on our street for like a week after they'd been arrested. All kinds of forensic vans with people in those full body white fabric suits going in and out all hours of the day. They were obviously looking for traces of the girl but whether or not they found anything I'm not really sure. I do know it was in the paper though and like I said, I thank God the guy never did anything to my dad because he did actually go on to murder someone, his own daughter at that. I feel like every neighborhood has a family of absolute psychos. Almost everyone I've spoken to about this sort of thing seems to remember one group of absolute wrong-ins, be it from their childhoods or from their current lives. And if there's one thing I've learned from their collective memories and stories, it's that whenever there's a family like that around, it's only a matter of time before something comes to a head, or something finally boils over. And that's exactly what happened with this insane family that lived in my neighborhood when I was a kid. Only the thing is, most of the people I've spoken to said the breaking point came when some kind of family argument or confrontation with neighbors spilled out into the streets outside. Police were called, arrests were made, usually a for sale sign or two went up in the aftermath. But I almost wish my story was that simple, or ended that relatively amicably, because what happened in my case is something that haunts me to this day with possibilities and ramifications that I find genuinely terrifying. I grew up in the 70s Britain, in a pretty small town in a place called Wiltshire. We were quite a small community, everyone knew everyone and consequently, everyone knew everyone's business too. There was this one boy called Lewis and he was the only child of the prestige family. A very peculiar family name if ever there was one but that's not the reason I'll never forget it. The Prestige family were peculiar by name and peculiar by nature too. But then peculiar seems like entirely the wrong word to use. Peculiar makes you think of something quaint and adorably abnormal, but there was nothing adorable about the Prestige family. They were just weird, scarily weird too, and mean. I think one of the earliest memories of Lewis is during an assembly in primary school. It's about 8 in the morning and all the kids in school are sat in the main hall and it's deathly quiet apart from our headmaster making announcements and the soft sobs of young Lewis. He didn't stop crying for the whole of the assembly and they didn't just remain this quiet weeping either. His tears built in pitch and intensity until he was wailing so loud that a teacher had to remove him altogether. I remember feeling really sorry for him but as time went on it was just something you sort of got used to. They were the weird family in town and since they didn't get into any serious confrontations outside of their own family unit, people just sort of let them be. The next serious incident I remember was years later in secondary school, when the schoolyard suddenly became abuzz with people gossiping over something. People were crowding around the school gates, looking at something, some of them laughing, some of them just gopping at the sight of a lad dressed entirely in a school uniform except for one crucial piece of it, his trousers. And it turned out to be Lewis. From what I heard, 
He had been basically pushed out of the car by who we assumed to be his dad, and rumors went flying around that Lewis hadn't quite been ready to leave the house when his dad was ready to take him to school that morning. Instead of waiting for him to put his school trousers on, Lewis's dad had just dragged him to the car and taken him to the school with no pants on, basically to teach him a lesson to be ready on time. I'm not entirely sure how true that reasoning was, but I do know that I witnessed Lewis having to walk into school in nothing but a school jumper, his shoes, and his underwear with my own eyes. I'm also not entirely sure how Lewis was still allowed to live with his evidently abusive parents either. Again, rumors went around that they'd had a visit from social workers, but this I believe because, for a while, there seemed to be little in the way of serious incidents coming from the Prestige household. Obviously, the visit from Child Welfare Services has been enough to shake them up into changing their ways, or so it seemed. Now, this all came to a head when I was 15, maybe just over a year before we left secondary school and bid farewell to compulsory education for good. One morning, Lewis turns up to school in his own clothes, a pair of pumps and a colorful jumper. He gets pulled aside by a teacher who, I think at that point, was well aware of the situation at home, and Lewis says something quietly to him before the pair of them disappear into the building which housed the main office. The next thing I know is that, apart from the shoes he was wearing, Lewis has an entirely new school uniform. New blazer, new tie, new jumper, everything. And from that day on, he seemed like almost an entirely new person. He didn't get dropped off at school by his parents anymore. He seemed more confident and open, more talkative with the other kids. He even started playing football with us at lunchtimes, something he'd never done before. We actually got quite pally with him for a while, and on more than one occasion, he invited us back home with him to play. We politely declined, of course, thinking of some made-up excuse not to have to go around the prestige house, but still, things seemed to be making a vast improvement. Emphasis on seemed, though, because after a long bank holiday weekend, Lewis failed to turn up to school at all. This didn't have anyone talking about it too much. Kids were routinely off on the odd one or two days with illness, but Lewis went an entire week without showing up for school, and that really did get us talking. I don't know if it was because I was so young and naive or I just didn't connect the dots, but I didn't think that there was any link between all the police activity around our town and Lewis not being in school. One Saturday afternoon, my mom and dad called me into the kitchen and asked me if I had been around to Lewis's house at all recently. I told them no, but that I'd been invited at one point and when I said that, my mom gave my dad this look that seemed to be a weird mix of horror and relief like I dodged a bullet or something. Not long after that, I got word through some friends of mine that there had been a brutal double murder in the town, that someone had been arrested for it too. Our little town barely had any crime at all. I think the most serious thing to happen for decades at that point was a car theft committed by some out-of-towner. So the idea that there had been a single murder, let alone two, just set the town alight and there was much speculation over the who the killer was and how the killings had come about. Looking back now, I can see why the adults might want to shield us from the whole thing, and it was only a few years later that I actually realized why the police had made such an effort to keep the identity of the murderer a secret. It's like that when a murderer is under the age of 18. When they're a minor, their identity is kept secret for as long as is able. And that's only really possible with the media because it didn't take long before the residents of our town figured out what had happened, and it was bound to trickle down to us sooner or later. The reason Lewis's parents didn't seem to be around anymore, the reason he was so happy and confident and carefree, was because he had killed them. He'd finally rid himself of the people that made his life torture. I get that. But the fact that a kid killing their own parents could make them so happy, that's something I've never been able to truly understand. The horrible thing was looking back on the events later and sort of piecing together the puzzle. For example, the day he came to school in his own clothes was probably the morning he'd killed them. 
and since he'd gotten blood on his school uniform, he had to dispose of it. All the times he'd invited us back to his place to watch TV or play football, his parents would have been dead in the upstairs bedroom, assuming that's where he'd killed them. If we'd gone round, maybe we would have been able to smell them, or see flies buzzing around the bedroom door or something. We were all just one little spur of the moment yes from finding out, finding their bodies. Maybe if that was the case, then Lewis would have killed us, too. This happened a few weeks ago. I was hanging out with my friend Dustin, and we decided to go explore this creepy old abandoned asylum. It was a huge building, about three stories high. We walked past the railroad. We then continued to the old asylum. As we walked to it, I looked up and my heart dropped. From the third story window, I could see someone looking down at me and Justin. I stopped and he asked me what was wrong. I told him to look up in that window on the right. He looked up and saw it too. We continued to stare at it for about a few seconds before whoever or whatever it was moved out of sight. We then were deciding if we should still go in. We settled it. It was just some person trying to buy drugs or something. Drug deals and teens were always in there sneaking. We went past no trespassing signs and explored the first level of the building. There was a lot of broken glass and graffiti everywhere. There was this one that said, I love it when they run. Don't get me wrong, that was kind of creepy, but obviously done as a joke. So we made it up to the second floor and basically the same thing there, except for an old elevator shaft that was cracked slightly open. Dustin turned his flashlight on and put it in the elevator. We saw a whole lot of electrical junk, some dead birds and animals. If that wasn't freaky enough, we also heard something walking above us on the third story. My heart felt like it was about to explode. I had a bad feeling about this, and I told him we should leave. He said, nah, it'll be fine, and he started walking up to the third story. I didn't want to be left alone near the spooky elevator, so I followed behind him. We had our phones out, taking pictures of all kinds of stuff on the previous floors. As we walked up the stairs, I swear we were being followed and I told Dustin to hurry up. He went upstairs and I wasn't far behind. What I saw on the third floor of that asylum will haunt me for the rest of my life. There were pentagrams and animals all over the place. It smelled awful up there. There were some rooms in the back of the corner. Keep in mind, this is the floor we saw that thing looking down at us from. We heard what sounded like whispers coming from the middle room. We got our phones out and started taking pictures of it. After I got about two or three pics, I saw a figure step out of the room. My heart was beating so hard I swear it had come through my chest. It was the same person I was looking from the window. Me and Dustin were freaking out, but we didn't dare move. About 10 seconds of staring and it started sprinting at us screaming. I took off in a sprint down the stairs almost dropping my phone. I ran and jumped out of the two-story window and landed in some brush. I got up and ran some more before crouching behind some old shed. Then it hit me. Dustin was still in there. I hadn't even noticed him when I ran down the stairs. I texted him and asked him where he was but didn't reply. I sat crouched behind that shed for about three minutes before I saw Justin sprinting out of that house. I jumped from behind the shed and called his name. He saw me and screamed run. He looked behind him. Then I looked behind him. He was being chased by two people. I took off down the road, heading for the railroad. Dustin caught up to me, and we didn't stop until we made it to the tracks. We jumped in a ditch beside the railroad and looked up to see the two people standing at the door of the asylum. They were watching us, but then turned and walked back inside. We ran up to the local burger place and sat down at a booth. Out of breath, we ordered some Sprite and fries. While waiting for food, I asked him what happened after I ran. He said the guy chased him, and he ran down the stairs and saw me jump out of the window, and he ran to the elevator, where he found a small space behind some boxes to hide behind. He said after he sat there for a bit, the guy came down the stairs with another person. They were watching to see where we went. Then his phone went off because I texted him. He said they looked his direction and saw him. They then chased him down the stairs and out the door. And that's when I saw him and we ran. We didn't call the cops because we didn't want to get in trouble for trespassing. I don't know those guys. 
and I don't know what they were doing in that building, but needless to say, I don't think me or Dustin will ever go back there.